Well, we've been looking, uh, when I've been preaching over the last several months, at what I call living by grace. And we noticed, didn't we, at the beginning, that we enter the life of a follower of Jesus, the life of discipleship, uh, by grace, and that we continue to live that life by grace uh, as well. And I want to round off this series today, God willing, by looking at two passages here in Romans 8. Uh, this evening we'll be looking at verses 14 to 17 and looking at sonship and what it means to be a son of God. Uh, uh, but this morning I want to look at verses, particularly at verses 12 and 13, but also in the verses that lead up to that uh, and what it means to put sin to death. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. It's really being led by the Spirit. Notice there in verse 14, those who are led by the Spirit. For those who are led by the Spirit. So verses 12 and 13 relate to being led by the Spirit. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, um, as I indicated earlier, um, as we read this passage, depending on what your version is, you may notice that some of the words are different. I want us to go few, through a few of those words just to help us to understand the passage because I think it's difficult to understand this passage if we get uh, confused by some of these words. You may have noticed that when I read flesh, your translation may have had sinful nature. Uh, and the, the reason for that is, is it's a difficult word to translate. You may remember, many of you, about 10 years ago or so, we had uh, a, an American preaching here in this pulpit by the name of Doug Moo. Uh, and he uh, wrote, in fact, a, a, a comment. He's written two commentaries on Romans. Uh, I have one of them later commentary. In his commentary, he says that he was critical of the way that the older NIV translated this passage using this expression, sinful nature. Uh, and then later on, he was asked to join the translation committee uh, and given the job of coming up with a better word in its place. So watch out, whenever you criticize, you may be given a job. <laughs> that was Doug Moo's uh, experience. Uh, and he found it really difficult. But he said that it, it's better to use this word flesh. And the reason, the reason, if I understand it correctly, the reason is this. Uh, the word, the expression sinful nature can lead us uh, to, to have a wrong understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, some people would say that we have a, a sinful nature and a spiritual nature. And that there are these two natures in us that are, that are fighting with one another. But that's not what Romans is teaching. That's not what Paul is teaching here in Rome, uh, in this letter to the Romans. What he's teaching us is that we have been brought from one realm. Notice that in, especially you'll see that in uh, verse 9 onwards. From the realm of the flesh, from the realm of sin, sinful humanity, to the realm of the spirit. We have a new nature. We are in the spirit as disciples of Jesus. So the, word, the reason that Paul uses this word flesh is because he's, he's using it in a Jewish way because, of course, he was steeped in the Old Testament. Uh, and he's talking about flesh as in humanity. Uh, Peter uses that expression in his letter. He talks about all flesh is like grass, doesn't he? He's talking about humanity. Humanity against God. Sinful humanity. So this word flesh really means sinful humanity. It's like in other parts, especially John, uh, in John's letters, where he talks about the world. So flesh here doesn't mean that something in us, it means sinful humanity. We don't live according to sinful humanity, but we live according to the Spirit. That's what Paul is saying there in that first paragraph of chapter 8. And you may also know, uh, you may also notice and be confused by the word law in those first few verses. Uh, and that's because the word law, it's one Greek word and it's one word in English, but it actually means two different things, even in one verse. So we'll read those verses again. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, 
Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's one meaning. And then verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do, and that's a different meaning. So what he's saying in verse 2 is the law is a principle. There is a principle of sin and death, and there is a principle of the Spirit. And we've been set free from the principle of sin and death. That's the principle of the flesh. And we've been brought into the principle of the Spirit, so we can live by the Spirit. Verse 3, though, he's not talking about that. He's talking about the law of Moses. The law of Moses was powerless to do anything to make us righteous because it was weakened by sinful humanity. But then he goes on. What the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his own son. And here, he, in, here Paul uses a play on words. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now that is getting, that is cutting close, isn't it? Uh, because Jesus, of course, took on human nature. The son of God, when he came to this earth, he didn't cease to be God, but he took on human nature so that he was the God man. But in doing so, he didn't become a sinner. And so Paul introduces this word likeness. Did you notice that? So Jesus comes in the likeness of sinful flesh. He's just like sinful human beings, and yet he's not exactly the same. And it's because he's not the same, because he's pure, because he's holy, that he could do what the law could never do. And because we've been brought, as we saw earlier on in this series, into union with Christ, we can be made righteous as well, and we can be accepted by God. And so God condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. So I hope that that helps you to understand some of those words that are a bit difficult to, to uh, put together there in the first part of this chapter. I think it opens up uh, Knowing what those words means really opens up the passage better uh, than some, some other translations. Well, what we, we're looking at verses 12 and 13. And what we see here is this word, therefore. And Paul is then dealing with the implications of what he has been spelling out in this first half of, or first section of chapter 8. And the implications are these. He says this, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We are in a life or death battle. That's what Paul is saying. When I was a, 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 um, a, a grammar school, we had the army cadets and I was part of that. And we went for a couple of summer uh, summer camps uh, at real life army camps being uh, trained by real soldiers uh, and it was fun uh, and one day we we got to um, uh, do some what they call close quarter combat training so there we were walking up a valley with some machine guns in our hands with live rounds uh, and every now and then from behind a tree or behind a stone or a bush uh, uh, an enemy would pop up. Of course, it was just a cardboard cutout of an enemy, but we had to shoot it as quickly as possible. It was a bit like laser tag, only slightly more serious. Um, and, 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 and that's what it, it, it was a fun exercise. We had to react quickly. We were being attacked by the enemy. And what Paul is saying here is that our life as disciples of Jesus is just like that. We are under attack. We are under attack by sin. And so I want us to break this down by looking at it under three words this morning, and they all start with A. And the first is this, adopt, adopt. Adopt a wartime lifestyle. We're in a war with sin. It's not a time for messing around. It's not a time for playing around. This is serious, Paul is saying. 
Jesus himself warned his disciples of the cost of discipleship. He says, even he, you remember, he told this story about a, a, a king going off to war. Before he goes off to war, he sizes up his enemy and he thinks, can I do this or not? If he can't, he'll go and make peace. Do you know your enemy? Do we know our enemy is sin? Sin is a deceitful imposter. Sin is always seeking to attempt to do a coup on the throne of your heart. Just as the Taliban are seeking to do in Afghanistan, just as the army has done twice over the last year in Mali and probably in other countries around the world, there is always somebody trying to take over. And that in our case, as disciples of Jesus, is sin. Sin is attempting to do a coup on our heart. And we need to know our enemy if we are to be able to battle sin as God wants us to. What is sin like? Sin. It promises pleasure, but delivers death. We need to develop a hatred for sin. And one important way to do that, probably the most important way to do that, is this. Remember that sin killed your Savior. If you are a disciple of Jesus today, you belong to Jesus because he died for you. He died for sin, for your sin. And the Spirit impresses on our hearts that that's what Jesus has done for us. And therefore, how could we possibly live in sin any longer? We need to develop a hatred for sin then. We don't toy with sin. Sin is like a, a fire that's smoldering still. There have been wildfires, haven't there, in California and, uh, uh, and Greece and other places. Uh, and you know what it's like with a fire like that? You can douse it down and down and down. It seems like it's gone, but then it might flare up again because it's always smoldering. There was a fire in the recycling depot on the Vale a few years ago. And it took, I think it was weeks to put it out because it kept smoldering underneath. The fireman couldn't see where it was smoldering. But then a couple of days later, it would flare up again and more things would burn and there would be a big fire again in that recycling depot. That's what sin is like. We feel like we've dealt with it, but it's still smoldering away. So we mustn't toy with it. We must take it seriously. Later on in this letter, Paul exhorts the Romans, do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Another way you might translate that is, make no provision for the flesh. Imagine then if you were at war and you were leading a unit and you were up at the front lines uh, and in the trench and just the other side of the no man's land, there was uh, uh, the enemy. Uh, and you were enjoying a lull in the fighting. So it's time to make a meal. So you make a meal for your unit. And you need to do that. An army marches on its stomach. That wasn't that Napoleon. But imagine then if you then uh, made enough food for your enemy on the other side of no man's land. That would be gratifying the desires of the flesh. Uh, the enemy needs to wither, it needs to become weak. You hope that the enemy doesn't get food because then you can beat it more easily. Why would you then feed the enemy? That is Paul, what is Paul is saying. So let's bring that to our own application to our lives. Imagine then you're on the internet late at night and you're struggling with pornography. What do you do? Make no provision for the flesh. Set a cut-off time, a time beyond which you won't go on the internet. Maybe share that with a friend who can help you. There are apps that you can use to help. What about a modest lifestyle? Are you committed to a modest lifestyle? So when you're, you think about, I'd really like to have a new kitchen, 
Is that really in line with a modest lifestyle? Or is that because you want to show off to your friends? There are so many ways that we can apply this to our lives, aren't there? We need to watch our lives and watch that we don't fall into sin because of the way that the devil gets in and sin gets into our, uh, into our lives and seeks to um, create havoc in our lives. Develop mental habits which are in line with the spirit. That's what Paul says in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. What does the Spirit desire in our lives? Let's focus on that. Let's create mental habits in which we are thinking of things which are good and right and honouring to God. Imagine you're a kicker on the Welsh rugby team. You have to focus on that ball and focus on that goal. And so you don't play to the crowds. You don't wave and you don't smile to the, to, the, to the audience around you, but you focus on the task ahead. And that's what the Spirit desires for us, to take it seriously and to keep our minds sharp on the battle that the, 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 that the Spirit has given us to be involved in. Be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what the Lord wants us to be. He wants us to be like that. Verse 29 in the same chapter, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that we might be the firstborn among, among many brothers and sisters. That's what the Spirit desires for us. That is our end goal. And that's what God wants us to, to, to work towards. He's brought us into union with him, so that his righteousness is your righteousness, his perfections are your perfections, his beauty is your beauty, and his holiness is your holiness. That is already true, but the Holy Spirit has set himself the task to make that true in your experience. The Holy Spirit has begun a good work in you. So prepare your minds for action, as Peter says. Set your minds on things above, Paul says to the Colossians, not on earthly things. Let's find that verse Colossians 3 2 set your minds on things above not on earthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God when Christ who is your life appears then you also will appear with him in glory do you do that do you set your minds on things above surely it means at least that we prioritize time to focus on who God is and what he's done for us in Christ so we focus on him, and as Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Because when our minds are focused on those things, then the things which lead us into sin pale uh, behind, into the distance. We're making no provision for the flesh. Do you do that? So that's the first. Adopt. Adopt a wartime lifestyle. The second A is this. Accept. Accept that you can either kill or you will be killed. That's what he's saying. Verse 13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, you, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We're in mortal combat and there can only be one winner. Now, in the past week, YouGov published a poll. They polled a couple of thousand Americans and Brits uh, and they asked them, perhaps you saw this on social media, they asked them, uh, 
and, and a number of questions. Who would win if you are, were in battle with various animals? So if you were in unarmed battle with these animals, who would win, the animal or you? Uh, and it was fascinating to see the answers uh, and the statistics that came out of that survey. Uh, one, of the most, one of the most interesting was that over half of Brits thought they would lose against a goose. <laughs> but even more fascinating, I thought, was that nearly 10% of Americans thought they would win in a life or death battle against an elephant. <laughs> Have they ever seen an elephant? <laughs> Now that's humorous, isn't it? But it illustrates two things, two weaknesses in the way that we might view sin. And the first is this, that sometimes we think sin is so hard to beat that we simply give up. We're like the Brit with the goose. Oh, I could never grab that goose and kill it, so I'll just let him kill me. That's how some of us are with sin. It's just too difficult. I can't do it. But the other, weakness is that some of us just don't appreciate how powerful sin is. We're like the American who's facing up to an elephant and thinks he can win. Sin is deadly. It's like treating deadly predators as pets. Another story I read this past week was of West Mathewson. They used to call him the Lion Man. He looked after rescued lions in South Africa. And he used to take them for a walk every morning, these lions, as he'd go for his morning walk with his wife. But one day last year, the lions turned on him and killed him in front of his wife. How sad. It seems he forgot that these lions were truly deadly predators. Now, that's how it can be with our view of sin. Is that how you relate to sin? Have you grown lax in your relationship with sin? A great man once said, if you don't kill sin, it will be killing you. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. What does he mean there, verse 30? You will die. He's contrasting life in Christ with life outside of Christ. Verse 6, he says, the mind governed by the flesh is death. That's the end of one whose life is governed by the flesh. And Paul says, your end is death if you live like that. How can that be? It's... it's it's about being in union with Christ. If we're in union with Christ, as we've seen from Romans 5 and 6, if we're in union with Christ, then we will not live like that. But if we live like that, then surely, clearly, it is an indicator that we are not in union with Christ. Does it mean that we can't? Does it mean that we can lose our salvation? Not at all. Just later on in verse 30, he says this, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. That is a certain reality. It's so certain that it will happen, even in the future, that Paul can write that in the past tense, as if it's already happened. So you can't lose your salvation. If you are saved, you cannot lose your salvation. But if you are living for the flesh, Perhaps that's an indicator that you're not saved. That's what Paul is saying. By their fruits you will know them, says the Lord. If you are not putting sin to death, then sin will put you to death. That's what Paul is saying. So, adopt, accept, and now appropriate. It's the third A. Appropriate the Spirit's power. It all seems very difficult, doesn't it? Warfare is hard. It's ugly. It's dirty. It's horrible. But there is hope. And listen to that in this passage. If by the Spirit 
you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul says this, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, he says this, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. How does he do that? By the Spirit. We need to appropriate the Spirit's power then uh, in our lives so that we can put sin to death. Did you notice in this passage how many times the Spirit is mentioned? He's all over the page, isn't he? And that is a tremendous encouragement to us. It means that we don't have to try and do it by ourselves. So what does it mean to live by the power of the Spirit? It means surely two things. If you are in Christ, the Spirit has already been, the, the Spirit has already given you life. This is what we read in Titus, Paul's letter to Titus. He says this, but when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us, how? Through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has done that. And that's how we can live by the power of the Spirit, because the Spirit has washed us clean of sin, and he lives in us. God has invested in us in such a cosmic, mind-blowing, all-sufficient, mega-transforming, epoch-changing way already, you can guarantee that he'll not cash in his chips and give away his claim on your life. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion to the day of Christ. Isn't that encouraging, brothers and sisters? He's done that and he's given us his spirit to make sure that that is a reality now and always through our lives uh, until we either die or Christ comes again. So, no matter how lifeless your body feels because you've been working long hours, because you've been up at night changing nappies, or because your body is racked with cancer or whatever it may be. No matter how lifeless and weak you feel, you are more alive than the greatest Olympian collecting his gold medal at the Olympic Games. If you are in the spirit and he is not. If he is in the flesh, he is dead spiritually. But if you are in the spirit, you are alive spiritually. And so God, by his spirit, empowers and enables you to live for him. That's the first thing, surely, it means to live by the spirit. But also, if you are in Christ, you are in the realm of the spirit. That's what Paul is saying there in verses 9 onwards. We're in the realm of the spirit. Things are different now. We're not in the flesh. The Spirit is committed to making you more like your Saviour. So you're not alone in the fight. This is how John Piper puts it. How then do we walk by the Spirit? The answer is plain. We stop trying to fill the emptiness of our lives with a hundred pieces of the world and put our souls at rest in God. The Spirit will work the miracle of renewal in your life when you start meditating on his unspeakable promises day and night and resting in them. We've been given the power of the Spirit to put sin to death in our lives. Have you appropriated that power? It's something we need to do continually. It's something we need to do consciously and allow and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us. It doesn't mean, being led by the Spirit doesn't mean making choices about what work we're going to do, about who we should marry or what house we're going to buy. Being led by the Spirit here means being led to put sin to death in our lives by the Spirit. So it means to seek the power of the Spirit, to overcome the temptations to sin. And he does that 
by reminding us of all the Lord Jesus has done. So, we've seen again how living by grace means that we are in a battle with sin that will go on throughout our lives. But it won't always be like that. And let me just finish on this note. One day, it will be different. Sin, my worst enemy before, shall vex my eyes and ears no more. My inward foes shall all be slain, nor Satan break my peace again. Then shall I see and hear and know all I desired and wished below, and every power find sweet employ in that eternal world of joy. But until then, put sin to death by the Spirit, and may God give us his Spirit in greater measure so that we do do this to his glory. Amen.